Hey friends, Michael here. Welcome to the next episode of Gnosko Gathering. In today's episode, I've decided to take a hermeneutical approach to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Meaning, rather than presenting a commentary style video, I'll be giving a short preliminary exploration into the language and grammatical features of these verses, commonly known as methodology of interpretation or exegesis. So let's read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 from the NIV translation. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now there are six key points within these short verses that we will focus on in our study. 1. Christ is God's means of communicating. 2. Christ is the heir of inheritance. 3. Christ is the means through which all things were made. 4. Christ is the reflection and representation of God perfectly. 5. Christ is the sustainer of the universe. And 6. Christ is exalted high priest. The first thing we should notice is that the opening chapter is void of any salutation, but opens with a classical exordium, as the author brings to light the act of progressive revelation by which God has revealed himself to man. It takes on a literary and rhetorical structure that is unlike any other book of the New Testament. The elegance by which the verses are composed and the words used give credit to the artistic style. In the original Greek and the KJV, this passage is seen as one whole sentence, periodos, which brings together several clauses, giving it a unified body. The language device of alliteration is evident in the first verse, with the use of five words starting with the letter P in the Greek, which was common amongst ancient orators. The passage is believed to represent a hymn, which follows the role of the sun throughout, a common expression found in other New Testament hymns. Structurally, there is an important break at the end of verse 2 with the use of a semicolon, or in some translations, a full stop. This indicates that grammatically the subject is shifting from God the Father to making skillfully arranged statements about the Son from verse 3. The term in the past was believed by the Jews at the time it was written to be speaking of the end of the age of prophecy, which ceased centuries earlier. The Greek word used for the as a definite article confirms that it is not speaking of the early church prophets, but rather the Old Testament prophets. It is also plausible to conclude that the past tense form of the verb does not allow for a legendary or mythological interpretation, but instead means many years before. God having spoke and spoken in verse 1 and 2 is lelesis, which is aorist tense and is a participle in the Greek, constituting an event, an event which took place in the past, having been completed, and therefore should be rendered having spoken. A shift from past to present tense doesn't occur until verse 3, where the continuity of the Son's nature is underlined. At many times, or what may also be understood as in many parts, the idea of the phrase carries the meaning of staged revelation, little by little, over a period of time, as suggested by the Greek word polymeros. In various ways, or diverse manners, denotes the idea of different modes as suggested by the Greek word polytropos. The modes God employed to communicate his word in the Old Testament include direct voice contact, dreams, visible signs and visions. The term, but in this final age, is an idiom common to the Septuagint, hence the equivalent, in these last days, is the first expression given that identifies the writing as being influenced by the language of the LXX. The term may also be an allusion to Jeremiah 31-34, with the promise of a new covenant. 
The expression through his son contrasts the methods by which God spoke in the past. The prophet's ministry was partial and fragmented, not giving a complete picture of revelation. A prophet is one who was called and anointed by God in his spirit and spoke God's message to people, particularly the people of Israel. They are known in the Bible by various titles, such as men of God, servants, messengers of Jehovah, and watchmen. They were constantly led by God's spirit of necessity for their empowerment for their divine mission to preach God's message to the people who had least regard for God. The person of Christ overshadows and brings to completion the prophecy of this Old Testament story. Whom he appointed heir of all things. And the term all things is commonly depicted as the universe at large, a thought derived from Hellenistic philosophy. God fulfilled his promise to David that he would receive the nations as an inheritance through making his son the heir over all things. Here is an allusion to Psalm 2 verse 12 which identifies Christ as a royal son. And in Psalm 2, 8, where the sovereign Lord will give to the son the nations as an inheritance. As Abraham marked the beginning of God's redemptive history with his people, there appears to be literary similarities between the passage in Genesis 17, 5 and the text of Hebrews 1. What began with an heir of the nations, where Abraham is appointed as the father of many nations, has been brought to full completion with the Son as the heir over all things, through whom also he made the universe. It is worthily noted that in some translations, such as the TEV and CLT, the order of this verse is reversed, as the first statement, heir of inheritance, refers to the future, and the second statement, everything created through the Son, is in the past. Some translations use the word created instead of made. However, the Greek word for created does not imply that God created out of nothing, as some would insist. Rather, there is a conviction here that Jesus had to be the pre-existent Son of God through whom God created. Scripture affirms the pre-incarnate Christ as the word or wisdom, logos, the agent by which the Father created. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Direct parallel phrases of metaphorical nature are used with radiance, apogasma, and exact representation, sharakta, as well as glory, doxa, is parallel to being, hypostasis. Philo uses the Greek apogasma to mean copy, hence reproduction of image, Akon, to produce exact representation or resemblance. Uh, this Greek word apogasma is found nowhere else in the New Testament except for once in the LXX on the subject of wisdom, which is the radiance from everlasting light and the image of God's goodness. Here suggests the relationship between God and the Son, one of wisdom and eternal divine light. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. In other translations, the substitute for sustain is the word uphold, feron, from the root word fero, which conveys the sense of bearing or lifting up, showing that Christ is the central stability of the universe. The use of the word autos as his could represent either the father or the son's power in this action and has only minor bearing on the overall interpretation. Again, the word logos in this context refers to the creative agent who is Jesus Christ. Hence, the universe upholds continuity by the Son's power and command. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This statement of exaltation goes back to Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It was understood in early times as it is today that no literal location is implied by this, as God, being spirit, physically has no right hand. Instead, the right hand is figuratively a place of honour, which finds its roots historically with the Oriental kings who would associate the heir with them in the exercising of government. The act of sitting, ekathesin, from the root word kathitso, 
refers to the completion or fulfillment of something in its absolute sense, which ties into the finished sacrificial work of Christ for the purification of sins. The introduction to the book of Hebrews, through verses 1 to 3, is like no other found in the New Testament. Its stylistic nature and the employment of literary techniques creates a passage with which some to leave to be a hymn, while confidently connecting it with sermon-like writings. What appears to be a rather short and simplistic passage at first, turns out to be full of deep wisdom, providing a well-rounded historical discourse of the revelatory work of God the Father through His Son. Guys, you'll find a reference list in the description below for further study. Uh, if you've enjoyed this style of video, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. If you're new to the channel, click the subscribe button and the little bell for notifications uh, so you're notified of when I post a new video. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you all in the next episode of Gnosko Gathering.